Good evening. Well, at least those up here in front can hear me. <laughs> Let's try it again. Good evening. Good evening. Well, that's much better. It's good to see you all. Have you had a good day today? I was tremendously blessed by the message this morning. What a blessing. Let's never forget the reason for our existence. If we do, we have no reason to exist. I'd like to have a word of prayer and then I want to make a clarification. There's been a little rumor running around on cyberspace and I want to clear that up before we open God's Word, but let's have a word of prayer first. Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege of being here this evening. We thank you. This has been a high day, a high Sabbath, filled with spiritual blessings. Thank you, Father. Thank you for being a wonderful God. Thank you for your Son, Jesus. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Father, we ask that as we open your word, that you will be with us through the ministration of the Spirit and the angels. Open minds and hearts and help us, Lord, to make a decision to be faithful to you though the heavens fall. Thank you for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. It seems like because last evening I spoke about the relationship between the Father and the Son, that there have been some rumors running around that Pastor Bohr is anti-Trinitarian. <laughs> the reason I spoke about the Father and the Son last night is because that was my, the theme that I prepared. But I want to make it absolutely clear that the Bible and the Spirit of Prophecy both teach that there are three distinct persons in the Godhead. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I want to go on the record so that uh, probably some of the naysayers will say, well, he said so, but he doesn't. <laughs> I'd like to read just one statement from Ellen White on this particular topic. It's from a document called Bible Training School, March 1, 1906. So clear, we can't misunderstand it. She says, there are three living persons of the heavenly trio. So if you didn't get three, you get trio. <laughs> and then, in case you didn't get that, she says, in the name of these three powers, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Those who receive Christ in living faith are baptized, and these powers will cooperate with the obedient subjects of heaven in their efforts to live the new life in Christ. So there are three distinct persons. One, in the sense of unity, co-substantial and eternal. If you want to know a little bit more about the Godhead, I did a series a few years ago called Revisiting the Godhead. There's four presentations, and I deal with this issue of the Godhead that has become a conflictive subject in the Adventist church these days. All kinds of ideas going around about the Godhead. We need to be sure about what we believe. We need to be sure that uh, there are three living persons in the heavenly trio that are all cooperating for our salvation. I will be at the Secrets Unsealed booth this evening. I'd like to meet many of you. So if you want to come to the exhibit area, I'll be looking forward to be able to talk with you and share with you uh, during the time that the booths are open. Now we will transition into our study for this evening. The Apostle Paul is known as the great apostle of grace and faith. But what is frequently overlooked is that Paul is also the great apostle of good works. In the epistles, 
of Romans and Galatians, where the Apostle Paul deals more specifically with the issue of righteousness by faith, the Apostle in the first half of those books presents the theology of justification by faith. And in the last half of those books, he presents how this concept of righteousness by faith should impact our personal individual lives. And so, for example, if you go to the book of Romans, you'll find that Romans 1 through 11, the Apostle Paul deals with the theology of righteousness by faith. But in chapters 12 through 16, he deals with how this works out practically in our everyday lives. In the book of Galatians, he deals with the theology of justification by faith in chapters 1 through 4. And then in chapters 5 and 6, he deals with how this should impact our personal walk and our daily walk with Jesus. So Paul was not only a strong advocate of righteousness by faith, he was also a strong advocate of the importance of good works that flow from a faith relationship with Christ. But I don't want to study this afternoon from Romans or Galatians. I would like us to go to a passage that we find in the book of Titus, chapter 2, and I'm going to begin by reading verses 1 through 10. Titus chapter 2 and verses 1 through 10. And we're going to find here that the Apostle Paul addresses five groups. First of all, he's going to speak about aged men. That's in verse 2. In verse 3, he's going to speak about aged women. In verses 4 and 5, he's going to address young women. In verse 6, he's going to address young men. And in verse 9, he is going to deal with servants. So let's read that passage, and there are certain words that I'm going to emphasize. You're going to notice that most of what the Apostle Paul says here is behavioral. It has to do with conduct. I begin reading at verse 1. But as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine, that the older men, here's the first group, that the older men be sober, reverent, temperate, sound in the faith, in love, in patience. Then in verse 3 he goes on to the older women. The older women likewise that they be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. And now comes the next group that they, that is, that the older women, may admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the Word of God may not be blasphemed. And now he speaks to the young men. Verse 6, Likewise exhort the young men, to be sober-minded, in all things showing yourself to be a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that one who is an opponent may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say of you. And then he exhorts bondservants, exhort bondservants to be obedient to their own masters, to be well-pleasing in all things, not answering back, not pilfering, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. Did you notice the list of moral qualities in this passage? Certainly the Apostle Paul was concerned about behavior, he was concerned about conduct. And not only a theoretical idea of justification by faith, which is generally held these days in the Christian world. Now the passage that I especially want us to focus on 
are the verses that come immediately after these ten verses that we have read. We're going to uh, have a textual sermon this evening. Most of the sermons that have been presented are expository sermons. But we're going to study a passage, phrase by phrase, this evening. And that passage is Titus chapter 2 and verses 11 through 14. And I want to read the passage first and then we are going to uh, study it in more detail. Immediately after speaking to these groups, the Apostle Paul says, or writes, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Now let's analyze this passage. Verse 11, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. The tense of the verb appeared is in the past. This is something that occurred in the past. The grace of God appeared in the past. And what do we mean by grace? Grace is unmerited favor. Grace means that Jesus came to this earth and through his work he provided the means for our salvation. The Apostle Paul said, for by grace are you saved, through faith, that not of yourselves it is a gift of God, not by works lest anyone should boast. And so the Apostle Paul begins by appealing to the past. He says, the grace of God has appeared for salvation. That occurred as a result of the work of Jesus Christ while he was on this earth. But the Apostle Paul doesn't stop there. Notice what he continues saying in verse 12. Grace teaches us something. It says in verse 12, teaching us. Now let me say something about that verb, teaching. It is translated in various ways. It is translated training, educating or disciplining. In other words, grace teaches and it is in a present progressive tense, which means that grace is continually teaching. Grace teaches something. Continually grace teaches something. The fact that Jesus came, he lived for us, he died for us, he accomplished the necessary means for salvation that teaches us, is teaching us something. And the question is, what is it teaching us? What does grace teach us? Well, verse 12 continues saying, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts. What does grace teach us? It teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts. Once again, the word denying is in a progressive tense, which means continually denying ungodliness and worldly lusts. It is a present participle. It means that continually we are to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. Now what is meant by ungodliness? I think the best 
passage that we can quote to understand what ungodliness is is found in Jude 14 and 15. Jude verses 14 and 15. Here it is speaking about Enoch who lived in the one of the worst periods of history. He lived before the flood when the world was really going downhill in a hurry. And I want you to notice that this word ungodly is used four times. It says there in Jude 14, Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are, what? Ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Notice that the word ungodly has to do with deeds, it has to do with our way which has which deals with behavior and it has to do with what we do with our conduct. So the Apostle Paul is telling us here, he's saying denying continually ungodliness. But he not only says we're supposed to deny ungodliness on a continuing basis, he also says that we are to not deny worldly lusts. Now what does the Apostle Paul mean by worldly lust? You know this is the great Apostle of grace, the great Apostle of righteousness by faith. And yet he's not casting behavior aside. He's emphasizing the necessity of a change in the life. What is meant by worldly lusts? Well that word lust is used in Galatians 5, 21 to 24. Let's read that passage, Galatians chapter 5, verses 21 through 24. Here the Apostle Paul, in the practical section of his book of Galatians, says, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. There's the identical word. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. Now the works of the flesh are evident. And now comes a list of what uh, this, these sinful lusts are. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and it's not a complete list because he says, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. The words desires, they're the same word, lusts. So the Apostle Paul is telling us here that we must deny ungodliness and fleshly lusts or worldly lusts. You see, grace teaches us something very important. It teaches us that we are to reject these negative qualities, ungodliness and worldly lusts. But grace not only teaches us what we're not supposed to do, grace also teaches us what we're supposed to do. And so he continues saying that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should what? Live. How? Soberly righteously and godly in this present age. 
So Paul says, deny one thing and live another. Deny ungodliness and worldly lust and live righteously, soberly, and godly in this present age. Does the theology of the Apostle Paul have anything to say about our conduct and our behavior? It most certainly does. But now we come to a future focus. The Apostle Paul has said, the grace of God which brings salvation has appeared. That's the work that Jesus performed. But this is teaching us continually that we should be denying, once again a continual tense, that we should be denying ungodliness and worldly lusts. And we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. But there's a reason for that. And that reason is found in verse 13. Now the Apostle Paul is going to go to the future. He's already talked about salvation in the past. He's saying what we should be doing in the present, but with a view to what some, something that's going to happen. Very significant. Verse 13, looking for. Once again, a continuous tense. Looking for what? Ah, the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That expression, looking for, it's an interesting expression. It's used, for example, for Anna, who was looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. She was longing for it, in other words. It's used of Simeon, who was also longing for the consolation of Israel to come. It's used of Joseph of Arimathea, who waited or longed for the kingdom of God. In other words, this isn't only just simply sitting down and saying, oh, I'll wait. No, it is a longing for something. And what is it that we are to long for? Longing for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. The word blessed, by the way, is the same word that is used in the Beatitudes. Sometimes in the New Testament it's translated happy. So this would be the happy hope. The hope of the second coming of Christ. So Paul has taken us from the past, what Jesus did. Grace saved us without any work on our part. And then he says we should renounce ungodliness and worldly lusts. We should live soberly and righteously in this present age with a view of something very significant that's going to happen. And that is longing for the coming of that blessed hope of Jesus Christ. Now you say, how can we be sure that ha that hope will be materialized? For two reasons. Reason number one is because Jesus promised it. Is that a good reason? The Word of God states it. Jesus said, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, our many mansions. Notice Jesus didn't say, I'm going to heaven to build mansions. He says, when he said it, he said, there are many mansions. Jesus does not need 2,000 years to build mansions. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Then he says, I go to prepare a place for you. And you know, usually we think of that as Jesus going to heaven to make a real nice pretty place for us to go to. I'm not going to say that we're not going to have a pretty place, but there's more involved here. You see, when Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you, the way in which he prepares that place for us is through the work that he performs in the heavenly sanctuary. It's through His work in the holy and the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary as we heard about this morning. So that's how He prepares the place. He went to heaven to prepare the place through His work in the sanctuary. And then He says, 
after he has prepared the place, he says, I will come again. You can take it to the bank because Jesus said he will come again. So we can long for that hope because we know that it rests upon his word. You know, the hope of the second coming is not like saying, well, I hope so. No! <laughs> it's solidly based on what Jesus said. But there's another reason why we can be certain, and that is that Jesus has given us a down payment. <laughs> and he's not about to lose his security deposit. <laughs> Notice Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. Ephesians chapter 1, and verses 13 and 14. You see, Jesus has not only promised to come again, He has given us a down payment to prove that He is. It says there in Ephesians chapter 1 and verses 13 and 14, In Him, that is in Jesus, you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with what? With the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the what? the guarantee. That means surety, security deposit, down payment if you please, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of His glory. He's given us His Spirit so that we can know that the hope is certain. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 22, the Apostle Paul once again uses the same word, the word aras in Greek, which means down payment or security deposit. He says there in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 22, Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us in God, who also has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a what? as a guarantee. So we not only have Christ's promise, His word that He's coming again, but He's proven it by giving us the down payment, the down payment of His Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. Now let's go for a moment before going on to verse 14. Go to another passage in Titus, Titus 3 and verses 4 through 7. Titus chapter 3 verses 4 through 7. Notice once again we have this theme of the past, the present, and the future. Time and again in the writings of the Apostle Paul. You know, you ask Christian, you say, well, you know, um, how does salvation work? Is salvation a once for all thing? They'll say, oh yeah, it's a once for all thing. You accepted Christ and you're saved forever. The Apostle Paul clearly tells us that salvation is a process. It includes justification, it includes sanctification, and it includes glorification. Notice this passage in Titus 3 verses 4 through 7. For we ourselves were also, <laughs> that's past, right? Foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various what? lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. It's what we used to be before salvation. But, says the Apostle Paul, when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, past tense, that's speaking about the grace that comes through Jesus Christ, once again, but when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy, He what? He saved us. Through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out, once again passed, on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that having been uh, having been justified by His what? By His grace, we should become heirs of the what? Of the hope of eternal life. So you see, past and future. The future is guaranteed by what occurred in the past. 
Now let's go to verse 14 of Titus chapter 2. Here the Apostle Paul, once again, notice the tense of the verbs. Who gave himself for us. That's when grace manifested itself that he mentioned in verse 11. Who gave himself for us. Why did he give himself for us? Does grace teach us anything? This passage tells us that grace teaches us that there's a change in the life. So the Apostle Paul says, who gave himself for us, that, in Greek it's hina, which means so that. He did this so that this would happen. Who gave himself for us, so that he might redeem us. That word redeem means to buy back by paying a price. It's referring to his death on the cross, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed. That word lawless is the same word that is used and translated transgression of the law. Jesus redeemed us from our transgressions of the law. But not only did Jesus redeem us from our transgressions of the law, he goes beyond this. Notice how the Apostle Paul finishes this verse. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed, that is, from our transgressions of the law. But now notice this. And what? And purify for himself his own special people, what? Zealous for good works. Does grace teach us anything? Grace teaches us that we should renounce ungodliness and fleshly lust, and we should live soberly, and we should live righteously. Jesus appeared to save us so that he might redeem us from, yes, our transgressions of the law by justifying us, but also to purify for himself his own special people, and he wants his people to be zealous of good works. By the way, that word zealous is very interesting. It's the Greek word zeluntes. There was a Jewish sect in the times of Christ that was known as the Zealots. You know, they used all of their, all of their power to try and overthrow the Roman government. They were, they were zealous in their cause. Of course, their cause was wrong. The Bible tells us that the Apostle Paul was zealous in persecuting the Christians. His cause was wrong. But should we be any zealous for the things of God? The Apostle Paul doesn't say just do good works. He says that as a result of what Christ has done, we should be zealous of good works. So in this verse, we have the past. Jesus appeared. His grace saved us. But His grace is teaching us that we should deny ungodliness and worldly lusts. And we should be living soberly and righteously in this present age. And the reason why is because we're looking forward to the glorious coming of Jesus Christ on the clouds of heaven. Let's notice Romans 6 verse 22 where we have this same theme of the Apostle Paul. Past, present, and future. Romans chapter 6 and verse 22. The Apostle Paul tells us but now having been set free from sin, past tense, and having become slaves of God, you have as your fruit what? Holiness. Are you seeing the connection? The Apostle Paul says we've been set free from sin. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. We have become slaves of God. In other words, we become servants of God. And what is the fruit? The fruit is holiness. But that's not all. The verse continues saying, and the end, everlasting life. Once again, the same theme. Notice Ephesians chapter 5 and verses 25 through 27. Ephesians 5 verses 25 through 27. Once again, the Apostle Paul speaks about what happened in the past, and it should color the presence present and it should also make us look forward to the future. Ephesians 5 verse 25 to 27, husbands love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. See that's what Jesus did in the past. Jesus gave himself by living and dying for his church. 
But there's an intention or a purpose for that. Once again, husbands love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her that he might. He did that so that he could do this. Do what? That he might, what? Sanctify, that means to make holy, and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word that he might present, here comes the future tense, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. That he might present the church to himself, a pure, clean church to himself. You say, well, Pastor Moore, how is this possible? The secret is not really that difficult to understand. You know, the way in which we overcome sin and our lives are cleansed is not by looking at the law, but by looking at Christ. You see what happens when we look at Christ because we're always supposed to look at the grace of God. That's the grace of God in Christ is the incentive for the denying and for the living and for being zealous of good works in view of the coming of Christ. The past is the root. And so we must have our eyes on Jesus. And when I look at Jesus, you know what I see? I see one who is absolutely perfect. And when I look at the perfection of Jesus, what do I see about myself? The same thing that Isaiah said, I am undone. Or what the Apostle Paul said, a miserable man that I am. Or as Peter said, depart from me for I am a sinful man. You see, the holiness of Jesus rebukes our sin. Now that would be kind of desperate if it just rebuked our sin. <laughs> It'd be depressing. <laughs> but then I look at Jesus on the cross and I see this being that was absolutely pure and clean and perfect going to Gethsemane having his life crushed by the load of sin and then on the cross crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And so I look at Jesus and say, Lord, you're so perfect, you're so beautiful. You never sinned, and yet look what happened to you. Why did that happen to you? And Jesus says, because of your sins. And folks, when I see what sin did to Jesus, I will not want anything more to do with sin. Sin is not overcome by looking at the law. It's overcome by looking at Jesus. By beholding Jesus, we are changed. The problem is that we're looking at the wrong things. We're listening to the wrong things. We're looking and listening at things that make our sin stronger rather than rebuking our sin. When Jesus comes, he will have a pure people. I believe, folks, that once probation closes, the characters of God's people will be settled for eternity. I believe that God's people will have to live without an intercessor because Jesus will have laid off his priestly robes. Victory over sin must be won. But it's not won by looking at the law and looking, oh, well, how am I doing today? No! It's one by looking at Jesus in Gethsemane and on the cross and looking at his perfect life. That's why Ellen White said we need to spend a thoughtful hour each day contemplating the life of Christ. She says that as we look at the loveliness of the character of Jesus, we are changed, we are transformed. And the word that is used in Greek is the word metamorphosis. Do you know what a metamorphosis is? Butterflies go through a metamorphosis. You know what butterflies used to be? Worms. 
<laughs> and then they're buried in the cocoon like we are buried in the waters of baptism and lo and behold when the, when the creature comes out it's been totally and radically changed it's no longer a caterpillar that drags itself along no it's a beautiful butterfly that flies through the air it's been radically changed the word that is used in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 is that by beholding, by continually beholding, we are changed into the image of Christ. That's what we should be doing in the present, in the light of what Jesus did in the past. And looking to the glorious future, the glorious coming of Jesus Christ. I want to throw out a challenge as I bring this to a close this afternoon. The conflict series, the five books that Ellen White wrote, was, which are known as the conflict series, have 3,603 pages. It's the greatest Bible commentary that has ever been written. Hands down. If you want to know your Bible, read those five books in conjunction with the sections that they cover. Now here's my challenge, and I'm wondering if you're going to accept the challenge. If you read only 10 pages a day for 365 days, you will have read all five books in one year. Your life will not be the same. You will see Jesus in a new light because all of those five books are all about Jesus. And as you look at Jesus in early history, as you look at Jesus during the period of, of the prophets, as you look at Jesus in Desire of Ages, as you look at Jesus in the history of the Christian church, as you look at Jesus in the end time conflict and great controversy, your heart will be transformed and changed. So I ask this evening, how many of you are willing to accept that challenge? Do you want to stand if you're willing to accept that challenge? I'm going to ask you next year. <laughs> Even if I'm not invited to speak, I'm going to go around and say, did you, did you fulfill your promise? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Let's start. You know, we're at the beginning of the year. Let's start. I assure you, your life will not be the same after one year you will be so much in love with Jesus that then you're going to say I'm going to read the book education I'm going to read Christ's object lessons I'm going to read ministry of healing you'll want a word read all of the books that Ellen White ever wrote because they portray Jesus in a beautiful way praise the Lord for this response not everybody has stood and that's okay I'll be praying for those who didn't stand <laughs> that the Lord will help you see the light let's pray Father in heaven We thank you for Jesus. What a perfect pattern. What a beautiful character. But Father, we know that his, that his being was disfigured. He was crushed by the load of sin. Oh, Father, help us to concentrate on what grace has done so that we might live the way you would have us live as we prepare for the glorious coming of Jesus Christ in power and glory to take us home. Oh, Father, I thank you for the decisions that have been made. I ask, Lord, that each day you will remind us to read those 10 pages and that through prayer and the work of your Spirit, our lives might be transformed from glory to glory into the image of Christ. Thank you, Father. For in my prayer, for I ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Please be seated.